night, everybody. Um, welcome to tonight's uh, event, Revolution, and welcome to the Writing on the Wall Festival. Uh, we had a, a fabulous May Day parade to start off with the festival, and I think tonight is going to be, uh, you know, an excellent continuation of the theme and the idea behind the festival this year, which is to explore uh, a lot of radical ideas and to engage people as ever in as much discussion and debate uh, as we can. Um, I would ask you to make sure that your telephones are, are turned off if you don't mind. Um, and I would say at the end, obviously our fantastic news from nowhere, booksellers are over there and uh, there will be book signings, obviously we have to buy the books of all the, uh, the writers here tonight. My, my, my name is Mike Morris, one of the co-directors of, uh, of the festival and uh, really, really pleased to be hosting tonight's event. Uh, all three books um, and the writers that you're going to hear tonight, I would urge you to buy the books, I think they're absolutely fantastic, I enjoyed reading every one of them, uh, couldn't put them down and um, it really opened my eyes to, again, to you know, the uh, a number of, uh, of issues around radical ideas, including the sacrifice of people who are represented uh, within these books and the, uh, the way that they shone a light, if you like, upon society at the time that they were living through. And, as I imagine will probably be touched upon in the discussion, they'll also be, you know, shine the light upon today as well and some of the times that we're travelling through at the uh, at the moment. So, you know, let me introduce you to the uh, the three writers, who is uh, John Rees, who, who's here, who's going to be speaking first, then Charlie Mabel, and then Kate Evans. And I'm going to introduce each one of them as we uh, as we go through. There will be plenty of time for discussion, for questions as well. So, uh, you know, whilst they're speaking and whilst they're reading and discussing the books, if you've got any questions that come to mind, you know, get yourself prepared to uh, to get your hand uh, your hand up. First, I'm going to introduce is, is John Rees. John John Rees's book here is The Leveller's Revolution, an exploration <coughs> of the events of the early 1640s uh, in 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 England predominantly, but which um, touch upon issues you know, surrounding the country as well. The events that John uh, explores um, make the, 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 the events that we're going through today, if you like, and what we might regard as a turbulent year, as uh, like a breeze compared to a tornado when you, uh, when you consider what took place in, in a relatively short period of time. Um, and anybody who says that England doesn't have a radical history will be reminded um, when the king was not only deposed but lost his head as well, that England has an incredibly uh, radical history. Uh, John is a, uh, is a radical activist. He's a national officer of the Stop the War Coalition, a founder member of Counterfire, as well as a spokesman for the People's Assembly uh, Against Austerity. He's written on a number of occasions various books. He's co-wrote a People's History of London with Lindsay German and also Timelines of Political History of the Modern World. The Level of Revolution revisits the past, as I said before, um, and seeks to um, reassert the role of the levelers rather than being just, a, if you like, a, a, you know, a kind of ephemeral movement, but to actually look at them um, from the point of view as a highly organised force, and one that, particularly during its high points, um, had many of the features of what might be regarded as the beginnings of a modern political party, and particularly a political party of the, uh, of the working class. So please give a warm welcome to our first speaker tonight, which is John Rees. Thanks very much. Thanks for that introduction and for the uh, invitation to, to speak here. And I guess the first point to make is a very, a very simple one, and it's this. That in uh, 1649, the English people did something absolutely unprecedented. They put their king on public trial. They found him guilty of treason against the people. And at the end of January, on a cold winter morning on a platform erected outside the banqueting house in Whitehall, where it still stands, uh, they chopped off his head. Now, of course, in the uh, long history, the millennia-long history of the title of king or its related titles of Shah or Tsar or Caesar or Kaiser, um, monarchs had lost their lives. They'd lost their lives in battle. They'd lost their lives in political feuds. They'd been murdered by rivals, murdered even by members of their own family. 
but never like this. There had never been a moment in the entire history of human struggles where a people had put their own king on trial and found him guilty. In all that time, it was only possible for the subject of a monarch to be found guilty of treason against the monarch. It was not possible for a monarch to be found guilty of treason against the people. But that's exactly what the English people did in 1649. It was not, as Thomas Harrison, one of the regicides, the people who signed the king's death warrant, it was not, as Thomas Harrison said, a thing done in a corner. It was done publicly and before the eyes of the country and, in, and indeed uh, in front of the eyes of the whole world. The most uh, famous poet of the age, John Milton, wrote his first and second defences of the people of England so that everywhere in Europe it would be known why the English people had taken this remarkable history-shattering uh, step. And on that cold January day, on the platform where the king was beheaded, um, among others, there were two men. One of them was a man called Richard Rumbold, and the other was a man called John Harris. And they belonged to a political movement called the Levellers. And we can gain something of an insight into what the Levellers believed and how radical a departure it was from all previous uh, political thought from a phrase that was attributed to Rumbold himself, indeed spoken by Rumbold himself, uh, some 20-odd years later when he was executed in Edinburgh for part of a political plot. And on his own scaffold, he said this. He said, no man comes into the world with a saddle on his back and no man booted and spurred to ride him. And strangely enough, he picked up that phrase from John Harris, the other man on the King's Scaffold, when he used it in a level of paper called the Army Scout, which he edited, which was aimed at the rank and file of Oliver Cromwell's new model army, and which had been instrumental in the entire social convulsion which had ended in the King's execution. From the very beginnings of the English Revolution, nearly a decade earlier, John Lilburn, the best known of the, uh, of the levellers, people like John Harris and Richard Rumbold, the printer William Larder, the pamphleteer and printer Richard Overton, the remarkable uh, woman activist Catherine Chidley, had been associated together in a radical network. First of all, they were radicals in religion. Uh, at that time, in the 1640s, the Church of England, the established church, the state-backed church, um, was, out of all imagination, a more powerful body than you can imagine the church being today. It played the functions in that society that the education system, the mass media, the church, the civil service, parts of the legal profession play in modern society. It was an enormously powerful institution. And the um, government of the day, Charles I government, and his archbishop, Archbishop William Lord, were seeking to reimpose the full rigour of compulsory orthodox religion on the society. In the 17th century, you could not be anything other than a member of the Church of England, legally. You are required to be a member of the Church of England, you are required to be not much a member of the church nationally. You are required to be a member of your parish church. You are required by law to attend your parish church and to listen to the sermons and to have your children baptised at the parish church. And if you didn't, you could be hauled before the courts, you could be fined and ultimately imprisoned. Now there are many radicals who didn't want the hierarchy of bishop and archbishop connected to the monarchy where you went to church and heard the sermon preached by the priest, authorised by the government, didn't want to be part of that structure. The Puritans wanted a reformed church in which there was a much more direct relationship between the worshipper and God without the structure of state interference and the hierarchy and the tithes, uh, the taxes of the church, and its legal ability to find and imprison you. So these people were religious radicals. And they were religious radicals with access to print. 
They were running either in Holland and in London illegal printing presses that were printing illegal, religious, radically religious, and radically political, political uh, pamphlets. And from this corporation of gathering together in churches, illegal and separate from the state church, from the business of trusting people that you worked with to print and distribute uh, illegal religious material, they began to cooperate in the very beginnings, the very embryo of political organization. When it came to war, when it came to war, partly over this question and partly over whether Parliament would be uh, the um, effective crux of government or whether the monarchy would be the effective crux of government, these people expanded their horizons and their operations monumentally. The Apprentices of London, the single biggest group of young people in any form of training until the expansion of higher education in the 1960s, flooded onto the streets and literally drove Charles I from his capital in 1642, never to return until he was put on trial and executed in 1649. After two wars, a first and second uh, civil war, the ideas that had been held by these small groups of radicals at the very beginning of the English Revolution were widespread in the society, and their operations were on a very, very wide scale indeed. They had two weekly newspapers, the Army Scout, which I've mentioned, aimed at troopers in the army, and the Moderate, the main leveller newspaper. Rarely has there been a, a newspaper with a, a more inaccurate <laughs> title, uh, which their contemporaries realised you can find copies of the moderate in the British Library where one reader, obviously enraged by it, has altered the title with a little arrow that says immoderate and then after moderate rogue. Um, they had a sense of the, the challenge that this was uh, to the authority and they built such a powerful movement among the apprentices in London, among the rank and file of the new model army that in Putney in 1647 they came face to face with the leaders of the New Model Army, Sir Thomas Fairfax and Lieutenant General Oliver Cromwell, who had been credited, and rightly credited, um, with being the most effective uh, military commander and the effective winner of the First uh, Civil War. Um, but the army had elected its own agitators, that's where we get the word in the 17th century, it simply meant representative or agent, and they confronted the leaders of the New Model Army with a democratic proposal called the Agreement of the People, which was to establish a government on a significantly widened franchise, not a universal franchise, not a franchise including women, but a significantly uh, widened franchise and with rights to print and publish and free speech and rights of representative uh, before a jury, not a prerogative, uh, a prerogative court, uh, and with the right to associate and petition. And they came face to face with the most senior commanders of the New Model Army. And the best known of the levellers at Putney, Colonel Thomas Rainsborough, um, said this in those debates. said that the poorest he that is in England hath a life to live as the richest he. And I see no reason why any man should put himself under a government that he had, had not had a hand in choosing. And Henry Ireton, who was uh, the Commissary General of the New Model Army and also Oliver Cromwell's son-in-law, replied to him, if we do this, if we give the vote to the poor, they will use the vote to take property away from the rich. And Ireton said, everything that I say, all that I say, in other words, all that I'm arguing against you is because I have an eye to property. Now, the levelers didn't know and in fact, nobody in Putney knew then what we know now, that the vote can coexist perfectly happily with property. But it won't necessarily be true that if the poor are given the vote, they will use it to take property away from the rich. And the revelers were themselves small property owners, so they couldn't answer that accusation. But they built a movement, and they asked a question, which we are still debating and arguing over today. And they built such a powerful movement that the first board to any kind of democratic society, a hereditary monarchy and a hereditary aristocracy, were destroyed 
in the First and Second Civil Wars. A republic was founded for the first time in this country. The House of Lords um, was uh, abolished. And it was one of the first nation states in the world ever to do that. So we have a truly revolutionary moment compared to anything that had gone before it. Right here in this country, the Levellers and their associates did something absolutely unprecedented. And every revolution that came after it, the American Revolution, the French Revolution, the German Revolution, the Russian Revolution, has some part of what the Levellers did and said as part of its guiding philosophy. tonight. We're going to take a huge leap forward now in time from the uh, 1640s in uh, England to 1917 uh, in Russia with, uh, with, with, with China and Mabel. Uh, I imagine a lot of people will be aware of China, but uh, if, if you're not, um, he is a three-time winner of the prestigious Arthur C. Clarke Award, and he's also won the British Fantasy Award twice. Uh, published, I think, by the Quick count that I did some like 23 works of fiction and non fiction. Um, there are about, <laughs> given the odd that's, essay, that's, too. That's, as gen well. that's generous, so but yeah. He's taken that. Okay, that's good. Um, his 2009 novel, The City in the City, um, which uh, he was, I think, reading when you were writing on the wall last time, uh, oh, yeah. has been adapted for BBC Two. I'd recommend the novel before you see the, um, before you see the adaptation because it's absolutely a uh, brilliant novel. Um, China too is on the radical socialist left of politics. He stood for election on a couple of occasions. Um, fortunately, it hasn't distracted him from his uh, from his writing, and uh, I think he rightly is regarded as one of the leading British writers uh, of today, who uh, seems to have the ability to range across uh, genres almost without breaking his stride. And and with with October, it's kind of you know the the, the kind of odyssey continues. Um, it's called the story of the Russian Revolution. Um, and it's a real uh, fabulous retelling of the events of October uh, of 1917. Um, and he, he, he said, I read that uh, he'd written it from the point of view of those who are eager to be caught up in the revolution rhythms. And I was surprised on reading it, even though I know the outcome, we all know the outcome, <laughs> that I was actually kind of, you know, a certain tension with the, with the novel, rooting for, you know, the, 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 you know, the movement itself and the workers and hoping that they weren't going to be thwarted at the end. And it was the power of the telling of this. And what it does, and, and John's book is the same, is it kind of dusts down these histories and puts people back at the centre of these histories as living people who were caught up in their own moments. Uh, like John said there, that you know people didn't know the outcome, didn't understand exactly the, the impact of what their actions would be, but were driven forced by need, by desire uh, to move forward constantly uh, and making decisions as they went along. So I'd, I'd, I'd highly recommend it and please give a warm welcome to Charlie Mabel. Thank you very much. Am I audible like that? Thank you. Thank you so much for that lovely introduction and thank you for having me. Um, and uh, just a local shout out City in the City is being filmed in Liverpool. Oh, okay. um, so when we were, um, w when I was talking to the editors about writing this book, uh, which, uh, as um, has been said, it was, was very much specifically initially thought of in terms of telling the story. Uh, one of the things we were very aware of, um, I remember talking to my editor and, and him saying, you know, the thing is, the centenary of 1917, there's going to be a slew of books. We're going to be fighting for space. It's both good and bad news for me that that is not the case. Um, uh, and, and it's slightly different. I mean, of course, there are books coming out. I don't want to suggest there's nothing, but uh, not as much of a marking as I would both expect and hope for, you know, the most epochal event of the 20th century and one hopes beyond as well. So there's something um, quite remarkable about that. Um, what I'm going to do... Uh, 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 I'm going to do something I never normally do when I'm doing my fiction, which is I'm going to read from the end of the book, because unfortunately, spoilers are a bit redundant here, um, uh, you know, uh, it, it, it goes wrong. Um, so 
the, most of the book is precisely an attempt to kind of conjure up that sense of rhythm and that sense of, um, of, of existing within the event. The final chapter is uh, a, a more of a kind of um, a looking back and a consideration of, of the future to come, not least the twinkly-eyed uh, ghost of Uncle Joe, Stalin, kind of casting backwards through history. Um, so what I've done is I've just... Um, put a few bits from the final chapter together to give you sort of five minutes. So the tone of this is slightly different from the rest of the book. Um, and this is a sort of con condensation of a few key points from the epilogue. And it opens with a discussion of an extremely influential uh, book, What is to be Done. Not Lenin's book, What is to be Done, the book of that title from several decades before by uh, a, a radical um, novelist, uh, Nikolai Chernyshevsky. Chernyshevsky's strange book, What is to be Done, casts a long shadow. In 1902, Lenin named his own seminal tract on leftist organization after that novel of 40 years previously. Chernyshevsky's story is interspersed with dream sequences, of which the most celebrated is the fourth. Here, the protagonist, Vera Pavlovna, journeys from the ancient past to a strange, affecting, utopian future. And the hinge point of the book, the fulcrum, from history to possibility, is that dream's section seven. And that section, in its entirety, is two rows of dots. Something that is ostentatiously unspoken. The transition from injustice to emancipation. And behind that extended ellipsis, the smarter readers understood, lay revolution. And it was with discretion like that that the author was able to evade the censor. But there is something almost religious, too, in this unwriting from this atheist son of a priest. A political via negativa, the negative way. Apophatic theology is a way of speaking of God as unspeakable. And what we have here is an apophatic revolutionism. For those who cleave to it, a paradox of actually existing revolution is that in its potential for utter reconfiguration, it is precisely beyond words. A messianic interruption, one that emerges from the quotidian. It's unsayable, but it's the culmination of everyday exhortations. Chernyshevsky's dots, then, are one iteration of a strange story. And after the dots, he has us read an urgent gasp. Oh, my love, says the character. <clears throat> now I know all your freedom. I know that it will come. She's looking back at those dots. But what will it be like? And that question from this point in history can only hurt. Because the order constructed in Russia was nothing like socialism. The revolution would come to be embattled and assailed and isolated and ossified and broken. We know where this is going. Purges, gulags, starvation, mass murder... But October's degradation was not a given. It was not written in any stars. It would be absurd to hold up October as a simple lens through which to view the struggles of today. But it has been a long century since then, a long dusk of spite and cruelty, the excrescence and essence of its time. And even remembered twilight is better than no light at all. And it would be equally absurd to say that there's nothing we can learn from the revolution. To deny that October's sumerki, and the word means both twilight and the light of dawn. To deny that that sumerki can be ours, and that it need not always be followed by night. It's beneath our dignity to be shot down here in the street by switchmen, said one anti-revolution politician, shouting as his way was blocked by radical sailors on the very night of October. And what he meant by switchmen, says one witness, the radical journalist John Reed, I never discovered that there is a probable answer in a very unlikely place. In his memoir, many years later, the great Lithuanian Yiddish writer Chaim Gray records that the area around the switchmen's booths along the railroad tracks was the clandestine meeting place for revolutionaries. So it seems that that word had become a disdainful epithet for them, for those revolutionaries. Because what and who could be more inimical to all those who are convinced that there is one ineluctable root of history and that Russia was not ready for this revolution, if it ever would be? What could be more inimical 
than those who take account of the sidings of history, who switch the rails, those who take to them, to those sidings. Revolutions, Marx said, are the locomotives of history. Put the, locomotion, put the locomotive into top gear, Lenin exhorted himself in a private note, scant weeks after October, and keep it on the rails. But how do you keep it there if there's only one true way, if there's one line, and all your opponents are telling you that it's blocked? In, 1937, sorry, in 1937, the great Bruno Schultz wrote of, quote, events that have no place of their own in time. He talked about the possibility that all the seats within time might have been sold. And then he said, Conductor, where are you? Don't let's get excited. Have you ever heard of parallel streams of time within a two-track time? Yes, there are branch lines of time, somewhat illegal and suspect, but when, like us, one is burdened with contraband of supernumerary events that cannot be registered, one cannot be too fussy. Let us try to find, at some point of history, such a branch line, a blind track onto which to shunt these illegal events. And there is nothing to fear. End quote. So by the forest shacks are the points, the switches onto hidden tracks through wilder history. And the question for history is not only who should be driving the engine, but where. Onto such tracks, the revolutionaries diverted their train with its contraband cargo, unregisterable, supernumerary, powering for a horizon, as far away as ever, and yet seeming to career closer. Or so it looked like from the liberated train in Liberty's dim light. Okay, that's the end of the book. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks very much, Shannon. Um, moving forward, just a couple of years, um, but obviously directly influenced by the, um, the Russian Revolution and the events that uh, China has talked about, um, was the, the German Revolution and Rosa Luxemburg, uh, somebody who was a contemporary, um, friendly in many senses of the people who led the, uh, the Russian Revolution. But for whom someone who, in many ways, has been lost from sight. Um, just to digress, where Bob Dylan has a legion of followers who hang upon his every word, me being one of them, I have to admit, um, and, you know, reams and reams of, of books written about him. Compared to, say, Joni Mitch Mitchell, uh, who, you know, in terms of musicality, etc., is certainly, you know, on a, on a level with Bob Dylan. Um, you would struggle at times to find and, and you know, compare the, the, the amount of research, if you like, done between the two. I think you could argue the same between, say, Trotsky or Lenin or Rose Luxemburg uh, in relation to, you know, the, the, the writing and the recognition of the role of these people uh, in history. But this is something that I think has been addressed in quite a spectacular way by Kate Evans in their graphic biography. Of, uh, of Rose Luxemburg, um, and maybe, maybe it, 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 it takes a woman to really kind of get into and understand the life and the amount of sacrifice that it took for somebody like Rosa Luxemburg, who, um, you know, on, on the basis of her Jewishness, of the disability of being female, had so many bar barriers to overcome to be able to play the role that uh, that, that she that, that, that she did. Um, but in this book. You know, not just looking at the you know the kind of political impact. You know, um, Kate has not sh you know uh, certainly hasn't shied away from trying to explore Rosa Luxemburg in, in, in all of their complex kind of attributes, and has brought that to life in an absolutely beautiful book that uh, has been selected as graphic book of the year, choice by both the Independence and Observer newspapers, and has been described by Steve uh, uh, Steve Bell. Um, in, in absolutely glowing terms, as one of the most original talents in comics I've seen in uh, in a long time. Kate, Kate herself is very eclectic in terms of her work. She's published books on breastfeeding, tree protesting, and climate change. Um, and uh, but her work is always beautiful and always uh, thought provoking. And as 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 it is a a, a a graphic biography, Kate is going to be able to do this with the presentation. So please, uh, warm uh, welcome to Kate Evans.
you are left on the end to find it. It's okay. <laughs> Oh, it's the technical glitch time. Sorry. <laughs> yeah, yeah. From I'm always in agony that we're all going to see something we really shouldn't win this. Okay, so um, I don't want to have that thought. <laughs> Thanks. Thanks for giving it. So I took the uh, brief, literally, and I went. I just picked the bits of the book where Rosa Luxemburg is involved in revolutions, and I thought I'd go through them in turn. There's quite a few overlaps with China's book, which is a bit worrying, because I hadn't read China's book when I wrote it. So if there's any like, little glitches, historical glitches, you can just glower at me. From there. <laughs> so um, I'm starting in Russia in 1905. Now, what I've tried to do in my graphic novel is create a work that is... What you get is all the advantages of a film in that you have imagined dialogue and you have dramatic tension, yet you also have a document that's historically, you can reference it. So I base her language on her actual letters and at the end I reference them with the actual quotes from her work so you can see where I've been faithful and where I've diverged. Um, and this is Dr. Rosa Lux. I like to call her Dr. Luxembourg because people call her Rosa a lot, which annoys me. A bit like, you know, he goes, oh, Carl, Carl, do they? They talk about, you know, they give him months. And she was a doctor, and there, there weren't very many professors of, of, who were women at the time. You had to, there was one university in Europe you could go to, which would allow you to graduate, which you went to it. Um, so this is Dr. Luxembourg talking about opportunism at the end of 1904. And I try at all times to dramatise the sort of boring technical aspects of her politics with visual metaphor. So she's talking about opportunism, and that's the wing of the German Social Demo Democratic Party that um, is seeking to reform rather than um, seeking to achieve revolution. Opportunism is a plant that grows in swamps, spreading quickly and luxuriantly in the stagnant water of the movement. When the current flows swiftly and strongly, it dies away by itself. And then we have her cat looking fierce <laughs> over a goldfish bowl of opportunism. But this gave me the visual metaphor that I then needed to talk about the 1905 revolution. Part of the issue that I had in the book is that I was meant to have 120 pages to tell Luxembourg's story. I did it in 180, so I didn't quite manage that. But the whole way through, I have to compress. I have to really compress. I can get maybe six sentences on a page. And so I had to find a way of talking about the 1905 rev revolution in an abstract term. And this wave of popular protest is what I settled on. Um, so here you have at the top, you have Father Gapon uh, leading the crowd up, 100,000 people marching on the Winter Palace, and the troops are firing into the crowd. This is Bloody Sunday. And that then leads to a further wave of protest. As news of the massacre spreads, a wave of anger sur surges across the, Ru the Russian Empire. Students shut down the university. The bourgeois classes demand political representation. Sailors mutiny. Soldiers turn against their officers. Peasants seize land. There is sporadic street fighting. And everywhere, workers down tools and walk out. The mass strike. Half of all paid labourers in European Russia go on strike in 1905. Now, Luxembourg arrives, she's ill for most of the year and doesn't get there basically until the, the, the revolution has more or less petered out. She meets up with her lover, Leo Yorgashiv, and she works out at that point there isn't much impetus for a, a further push for political reform. This is her sitting around being cold. <laughs> And uh, she goes and interviews people. She's, she's a journalist, so she goes and researches, you know, so what's it like having a, a, a mass strike? And, and she researches the material conditions of the workers and the history of the, um, of the protest. And I created from that this sort of big bedspread, partly because embroidery is a women's um, uh, medium, partly because I like to layer in visual metaphors wherever I can. And um, so here are some of her quotes from the mass strike. The mass strike does not produce the revolution. The revolution produces the mass strike. Spontaneity plays a great part. Her theory of spontaneity that she deduced from this is a very interesting bit of political um, theory. Um, and I also use the bedspread because 
Rosa Luxemburg was in bed with Leah Yorkshire's when they get arrested. And she writes to a friend, I was found in rather an awkward situation, but let's pass over that in silence. <laughs> I did wonder when I was drawing this, like, I, I draw her for all the sex scenes, and I'm like, what if she could see this? Oh, very different times. <laughs> so this is her arrest photograph. She could obviously do that hairstyle without a mirror. <laughs> and this is her writing from jail. The case is a serious one, and we are living in turbulent times when all that exists deserve to perish. During my lifetime, things have gone superbly. I'm proud of that. The cell doors are being closed now. So she was writing her epitaph, and when we remember Luxembourg's famous last words, I am, I was, I am, I shall be, this wasn't the first time she'd had to write her epitaph. She assumed that she was going to be uh, executed at the end of 19, in 1906, and, but fortunately she gets bribed out of prison. Fast forward to Russia, 1917. And Luxembourg's in prison again, but she's been in prison this time in Germany. So she's, she's Polish, um, she's a socialist. Poland is part of Tsarist Russia. Um, you can't be a socialist in Tsarist Russia if you're four foot ten with a gold tooth and a pronounced limp and you're obviously Jewish and female because the secret police will spot you very easily. <laughs> So she lives in Germany, which is a great place to be a Marxist theorist because there are 72 um, a na a socialist newspapers all around the country. The Socialist Party has got a membership of a quarter of a million members. It's a great place to be a socialist and it's a great place for her to make a living. Although she is effectively a refugee <coughs> and anti-Semitism and anti Polish sentiment and sexism dogs her contemporary reception as well as her, the past sort of appreciation that we've had of her work. So she's writing from prison again. It's, she's imprisoned indefinitely because she's opposing the war, so she's in there for as long as the war is at, and events are kicking off in Russia. And she writes, I'm ready at my post at all times, and at the first opportunity will begin striking the keys of world history's piano with all ten fingers so that it will really boom. But right now, I happen to be on leave from world history through no fault of my own. <laughs> Outside the world of Ronka Fortress, world history plays on. By January 1917, many millions of lives have been sacrificed to the incompetence of military commanders who fail to recognise that men cannot run through machine gun fire. In March, February by the Russian calendar, rallies for International Women's Day spiral into mass strikes that engulf Petrograd, St. Petersburg. Now, when it gets to this point in the book, from a graphic novelist, all of a sudden, uh, from 1912 onwards, we have documentary photography, and that's really noticeable when comparing the 1905 to the 1917 revolutions. In the 1905 revolution, you've got some sort of contemporary engraving sketches that are made by people, and you may have like a studio photograph of, of Father Gapon, but you won't have, you know, a snapshot of what it looked like in action. But in 1912, there's the invention of the Kodak pocket vest camera, and all of a sudden, you can take photographs as they go along. So this is the actual photo of the women marching um, on International Women's Day. And here's my rendition of it, including my attempt to draw the Cyrillic with no idea what it says. I really hope it's something along the lines of soldiers' wives march for peace and bread and not march by our lovely margarine. I've just got no idea. <laughs> or even if I did it right. Soldiers refuse to fire on crowds of men. I'm simplifying massively. You can get all the detail in China's book here. But there is a contemporary account of women uh, bearing their breasts in front of the soldiers and going, shoot me then. And the point is they are marching as the wives and mothers and soldiers. So there is every incentive for soldiers not to fire upon them. And the revolutionary potential of women here is one I think that shouldn't be understated. Tsar Nicholas abdicates and is placed under house arrest. And look, there's my little, my little poignant picture of the Tsarevich. Inherited privilege didn't work out for him, did it? <laughs> the Duma attempts to rule the country, but much power li now lies with the Workers' Council. This is, a, this is my artistic representation of dual power. On the one hand, you have the aristocrats looking annoyed, and on the other hand, you have the Soviets looking smug. Um, this is Lenin arriving in his train. And this is, on the 25th of October, Lenin and the Bolsheviks stormed the Winter Palace, disbanded the, the provisional government, 
and seize control of Russia. So there you go, that's the whole of China's book, <laughs> just done. <laughs> and I'm going to contrast this with some events from Germany 1918, again putting all the nerdy photographs in because I don't get to do that normally, you just read the end product. So that's the Hochstieflotte. I have very few words of German, but they're things like Kaiserreich and Hochstieflotte, only specific to doing Google searches of the events of the German Revolution. Now, the German Navy has been sat in, um, in, in Wilhelm's Harbour naval base for most of the war. They sailed out to the Battle of Jutland, which both sides decided was a, that they won somehow. Um, but it was a major sea engagement, and it kind of worked out pretty well that if you fight head on, you're going to blow all your ships up. And they wanted to set, the Germans wanted to save their um, navy for the strategic purpose that they were going to win the war, and then they wanted to have lots of ships left to exploit the empire that they would have created. By the end of uh, 1918, it's pretty obvious that Germany's not winning the war, so the Admiralty has this brilliant idea to sail all the ships out to engage in a last desperate battle for death or glory. Now, the sailors aren't particularly keen on this idea. And uh, ships are quite a good place to ferment revolutionary potential. It's, you've got lots of guys, living, they've been twiddling their thumbs for most of the war. They're not keen to go and get murdered. Um, skipping a bit from the book here, you have the morning of the... Oh. Yeah, the, the morning of the 30th of October. So the, the situation is that only the Thuringen and the Markgraf have been overtaken and are flying red flags. But none of the ships sail out to make war. And such is the nerdiness of my research, that is actually the Thuringen and the Markgraf there. Mm -hmm. And I have drawn the little Gothic writing of Kriegsmarine on the brims of their hats, because you have to find things like the uniforms, which I quite enjoy. Um, here is the, so the Admiralty regains control of the fleet, brings it back to Kiel. Um, and they arrest 49 sailors for insurrection, and everybody knows that they're going to be um, murdered by a firing squad. And at this point, the sailors start taking to the streets. The photographs from the bottom uh, are from about two days later, but I think it's representative of what was happening in Kiel. It says, um, and, and there's, because I spend a long time looking at these photos, I kind of notice these little details, like, do, do we get a... Like, like, so if you look at this handrail here, yeah, no, people are standing on it. They have got a really different attitude to health and safety <laughs> at this point. <laughs> Demonstration grew by the minute. So in, cafe, in, in the middle of Kiel, um, the, the crowd is, is fired upon. I get to do action shots. I never got to do action like comics before. Breastfeeding doesn't require much mean machine gunning as a, as a topic. <laughs> Um, the people screamed in indignation and protest. These words are from contemporary... I always use primary sources wherever I can. Partly because the secondary um, biographies of Rosa Luxemburg are rubbish. Um, and the, the, hour had come for a the hour for a decisive confrontation had come. We had witnessed the spark that made the powder keg explode. Something unstoppable has started. Now, the situation in Kiel is that the soldiers that are sent to put down the rebellion have nothing to lose by joining it. So they throw their weapons down. And it, the insurrection spreads throughout Germany, and by the 11th of November, crowds are on the streets of Berlin. Now, I studied the First World War at A-level, and they mysteriously forgot to mention the German Revolution. They go like... And then Germany was defeated, and then the war ended. That's what they said. They don't say, and then the workers seized the means of production and took to the streets and overthrew the government and got rid of the Kaiser and, and, <laughs> and put the socialists in charge. They, they just kind of glossed <laughs> over that there. But I really like this photo because you can see there's a mixture here. Look on the top layer, you've got some, you've got some Marines there in their hats with the Gothic writing on the brim. On the front there, you've got some um, sailors with their very echoey tin helmets with the funny little, um, funny little holes in them. Um, that is almost certainly not their car. <laughs> <laughs> so I use this picture for my picture of, of the masses on the streets of Berlin. Partly also because I really hate drawing crowds, particularly crowds of people with hats. So if you put a car in the front, lots of slogans and some big red flags, that minimises the number of people you have to draw. <laughs> um, uh, the, uh, 
um, Philip Scheidemann stands and declares Germany a republic. And, and, and have a look over here, because here's a photo. Right. He is standing on the windowsill. <laughs> this man is in his 70s. <laughs> uh, that's what I like. You, you wouldn't make this stuff up. If you were like, let's invent a story of what was happening in Germany, for example, you wouldn't have, we've, here we've got Karl Liebknecht, um, you wouldn't have people standing around in trees listening to speeches. They're like, oh, I'm going to go listen to speeches. I think I'll just go and, stand, I'll just go and climb that tree while I listen to the speech. And, um, and because I stare at this for ages, like, all these guys here, yeah, they're balancing their guns on their shoulders. But their guns had straps, yeah? But they've just got them, like, balanced like that. And I was looking at that and I realised it's because then they can go like this. And fire. And... The basic factor here is, is that you've got a, lo a very highly armed, you've just armed huge swathes of your population. That would seem to be how revolutions happen, which the Trump administration should kind of take account of. <laughs> At this point, Rosa Luxemburg is released from jail. Where great things are in the making, where the wind roars about the ears, that's where I'll be, in the thick of it. Now, I'm not going to tell you what happens next. But you can probably work out that she did manage to institute world revolution and save us all from the horrors of the 20th century. Um, doesn't have a happy ending, actually. Um, but I'm, so, I'm going to read to you from a letter that she wrote, because something that Kieran said is that one of the privileges of writing about history, particularly when you go with specifically... Well, I don't, I'm not being creative here. I'm, I am just rendering the human aspect of a historical figure and with Luxembourg we have her letters and they are amazing. Again, like consider how truth is stranger than fiction because if I was going to invite, uh, invent an Edwardian heroine from 112 years ago I would not write this. It's May the 13th, 1907, London's East End. The Russian Social Democrat con Congress gets underway tomorrow. This isn't a very promising start. Don't worry, it gets more interesting than it. I'm sitting alone in a restaurant in the infamous Whitechapel district, and it's after 10 o'clock at night. In a foul mood, I travel through the endless stations of the dark underground and emerge lost and strange in this strange and wild part of the city. It's dirty here. A dim street light is flickering. Drunken people stagger, shouting down the middle of the street. Newspaper boys are yelling. Flower girls are screeching. Omnibuses creak past and crack their whips. It is chaos. Finally, I found the hotel. Why, the very name is suspicious as hell. <laughs> <laughs> A brightly lit dining room, but empty. I breathed a sigh of relief when I saw two women sitting at a little, a little table, but then... I saw that all the guests were familiar with these women and were sitting down at the table to join them, still wearing their hats. <laughs> <laughs> On the other side of the wall, I can hear a variety show of an unambiguous sort. As the, <laughs> as the couplets are recited, after each one comes raucous applaud with a stamping feet as though a wild horde was loose. But suddenly, inside me now, some gypsy blood has been awakened. The shrill chords of the night in the big city with its demonic magic have touched certain strings in my soul. Somewhere in the depths an indistinct desire is coming to light. A desire to plunge into this whirlpool. <coughs> yeah, so if I was an inventing Rosa Luxemburg as a historical character, I wouldn't, for example, have her going out with her best friend's son, who's 14 years younger <laughs> than her. What will the young man with the thick head and the deep, dark eyes say about this? The young man whose face breathes of calm and stability, in whose soul the grey mist of morning is beginning to stir and surge up at the sight of a marvellous mountain landscape at sunrise. P.S. All this is nonsense, dear boy. Go get some sleep or take a walk. Adieu, Rosa Luxemburg. <laughs>